speaker has many wonderful titles, like playful educator, things like that, but really his brilliance transcends any of that. Um, in addition to that, he has this incredible story of being born in Taiwan and then thriving here. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna let him fill you with glee, delight, and joy as he does for so many others. It is my wonderful, wonderful honor to introduce Quan Ru. Welcome to the stage. Thank you, Andrew and Doggy. It's my pleasure to be here uh, at my shared LA. Oh, yes. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Um, so it was my pleasure to be here. And I, uh, right now I live in Berkeley. I, in the daytime, I work as a lab manager at UC Berkeley. But at the nighttime, I'm, a, uh, I'm also a, a dad. So like at the night, nighttime, I can get, build my, my robots. Um, so before I keep going, I want to uh, show this warning. So uh, the following presentation contains a lot of green image. If you don't like green image, please uh, go get a te tequila or go talk to um, Brenda to get a really tasteful um, a cheese, uh, chicken rice. So um, I was born and raised from Taiwan. Um, and but uh, not not part. So my grand grandfather was a rice farmer, and so does my grandfather, and my dad. Um, so so my, when I was growing up, my my dad said like, "Stop, you're not going to be a rice farmer." Um, I've heard uh, engineer can earn a lot of money, so you go to an engineer. So that's how I went to uh, engineering school. But um, so our family has a lot of rice. Rice, uh, rice farm. Uh, sounds fantastic, right? Because you get free rice every day. Um, well, that's only part of it, but not quite true because rice farming is really labor intensive. So that means like during the transplanting season or harvesting season that all the family has to, to go to work. When my, my friend goes to see movies, the new Iron Man had to go to work. Um, and so basically, I basically grew up in the mud and then by observing how rice grow and how um, I, I, I think I sort of developed develop a sensibility toward the, the change of the weather and the change of the season. <laughs> Sorry, I think that was called allergy. <laughs> but um, um, fast forward, since my dad told me to go to engineering school, I did went to uh, electronic engineering in my undergrad. And I, um, and I went to, I did a master in Carnegie Mellon University um, where I learned, start to learn how to build robots. This was the first robot that I built. It's called Bongi. Um, it's, uh, it doesn't do pretty much, but just like leaking the plants. Um, and this was the second robot that I built. Um, it's called Robotbot. It's a robot that when you, uh, sing a song or uh, tell a story or just yell at it, it will walk. Um, this is the third robot that I built. It's called Robot Butterfly. Um, when you shine the lights on it, it flaps its wing. So it's like, you know, go toward the light. And this was my thesis. Um, I built a robot that for kids that can build their own robot. It's like a, a construction kit. Uh, you can attach them together and uh, create another behavior. So wait a minute. There was a common scene in, my, in the robot that I built. They're all like bugs. So for some, for some reason, I was obsessed with the robot bugs. So, uh, so that led me to my next journey when all my friends went to um, Bay Area to work for um, intern, uh, to intern at Google or Apple. I stayed in Pittsburgh, and I worked at a, a work at a, as an artist uh, assistant at an artist studio. Uh, his name is Ian Ingram, and he's in the crowd. Um, yay! He was also like a. He also lives here now. Um, but one of the projects I built, uh, uh, I helped with with Ian was called Dangerous uh, Squirrel Napkin. It's called. It's a. It's a robot that uses computer vision to detect um, like predators, like fox or dog or human beings, and and it will use. Uh, 
like squirrel's own way to signal the alarm system by like flicking its, its tail. It's the amplified version. And building this project was fantastic because like, oh, like not all the robots are like looking like terminators or other robots. There's other robot that lives in the nature. So I start my, um, I begin looking into like how, like what, what are the, the similar robots out there in the world. And I found that there are many people in the world that are building similar, like they share the same interest. Uh, for example, Caravel was a robot, it's a symbiotic robot uh, built by artist Ivan Herakis. Um, it was a robot that used uh, micro, microbial field cell and then when, um, when it float around the, the water, the process of generating, getting the power also uh, purify the water. In the middle one, top middle one, uh, Phyto Walkers built by Junji Yamaoka. It's a robot that walk on the um, airplane. So it was small as a pot, like upside down, but when the, the plane grows bigger, it actually starts to walk. And then when the, the plane goes longer, it walks faster. Um, Artist Wet Gret Wet built a roller coaster for robots at, on, on the roof of a Children's Museum in, in Pittsburgh. Tumbleweed uh, bought uh, down below. Uh, it's a robot that travels for, for long distance. And then when it travels, it also spread out the fertilizer. So the idea is to prevent the desert to keep uh, expanding. There's a group of European art, uh, researchers uh, and technologists and artists uh, in Germany. They, they form a group called Flora uh, Bodica. And then they build a bunch of symbiotic, uh, symbiotic robot that focus on like how do you combine robot and plant together. An artist Anne um, Krenz, she built a robot that will carve out poem, like story in the most coat on the tree to tell the story how 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 like nature and beings can live well together. So there's a lot of people out there are building robot in the wild. That made me start to thinking like, maybe I should build my own robot in the wild. The idea start from like, um, so n right now we have all the robot that in, it's in the room. Can we build a robot that's in the woods and then benefit from the nature? And also the other way around, since plants are all in the wood, uh, woods, can we have plants that live in the robot and then benefit from the robot? And this type of relationship, uh, this type of symbiotic relationship uh, intrigued me a lot. I still don't know um, the answer, if that's possible, so I began my journey. I started looking into material that's um, good for robots. So if you, when you think of robot, it's not, it doesn't necessarily to be like bolts and nuts and iron, steel. It could be something that's soft. So is there a material that's good for, first good for um, robot to withstand the nature, like it's, maybe it's waterproof, and also could it be also a good place for plants to be in? Those two, uh, uh, those two requirements made me start looking into this type of material called silicon rubber. And they are used a lot in, right now in a lot of soft robotic research. I started by planting different seed. Those, most of the seed, they don't need soil to live on. Um, so they, they did a pretty good job. So basically I just put the seed in there, inside and I pump water and after 10 days or five days, they, they all come out. I did a, a different type of um, arrangement, different seed, uh, different, different morphologies. And in it, I built this bot. It's called, oh, by the way, I also found out you can, as a plant on the robot, one of the benefits is you can use it as a sensor and you can sense the environmental pressure. Or for, in this ex example, it says uh, human touch, that's a capacitance sense. And then you can also sense different direction, like when you touch it from one side versus the other side. So I built this robot, it's called GrassBot. Um, the body of it is inspired by the Harvard University research group called WeSight Research Group. But um, slightly from their, their research, their design, I add another layer on top of those robots. Um, and I could, I put the wheat grass or cat grass. Um, on it. So this is um, how it looks like. It's a crawling robot. Um, unfortunately, it's still tethered, so you have to like pump air. It has like, little, like a little bit long tail in the back, but it walks. Um, 
And the idea is like in the far, far distant future when humans are all gone, but somehow robot and plants, they found a way to evolve themselves. And then they became like, they developed a symbiotic relationship between each other. So the robot will carry the plants around to search for water and the plants will first camouflage the robot and also help um, sense their environment. So um, last year when I was in LA, um, um, I, was, I got an opportunity to show a piece in uh, Ingo Woods uh, Beacon Art Building. And that's about the time when I, my daughter was born. So I was like really uh, inspired from that. So I built this, and also since it's LA, so grass probably don't survive for like more than two days. So I started looking into moss. If you look at it carefully, it's like a baby when, when they're breathing. So it's usually um, like calm, but sometimes it get rapid and shallow. So this is an interactive piece. When you pat it, when you touch it, it becomes calm and slow. And at that event, I met um, Andrew. And then we were like, oh, maybe we should build a big one. Like, all right, let's do it. So we started to use the same method. And then we find a little uh, like big uh, water tray. And then to, to pour a bunch of silicon rubber to it. To give you the size of this, um, this bladder, we have uh, Andrew <laughs> as a reference. So Andrew is big. So this robot is big, you know? So this is called Teenage Mado. It's because it's, it has grown from the newborn piece, the small piece. So it also develops a little bit of temper. Um, it usually breathes slow and calm, but when you touch it, it, it reacts to you. You can try it, it's over there, she's over there um, by herself. So this robot really made me start thinking like, um, there's a, when I, when I observe in people interacting with robots, they tend to follow the breathing pattern. It could be a really meditation piece. And it also make you start thinking about nature differently. So in the nature, like what we do we think of, what we think about nature and what we think about robot. In this piece, like all are blurred, to, uh, everything's blurred. And then you just focus on your sensational experience with this piece. And so maybe, hopefully, that will bring your experience back to the nature. So I will come to go over there and interact with the robot. Um, in, in my conclusion, I think like if you have seen the movie called uh, Lapta Castle in the Sky, there was a robot in, in a floating city. No one lives there, man is our go gun. But there's only one robot used to be a killing machine, but he's there protecting the nature and be a guardian. And can one day, our robot is not the one that destroyed the nature, but to protect the nature. Um, maybe that day will come. So for that, for that um, goal, friend and I started a, a group, artist group called Natura Machina. It's a Latin term. It means nature machine. Um, we, right now we are four, only four people. We are all from different backgrounds. And then we wanted to build robot that's like not only live in the wild, but also benefit good for the wild. And also, we also want to build installation indoor for people to experience with nature again, nature again, and also think about robot differently. And that was my talk, and I hope you enjoyed it. And then, thank you very much.